Welcome back, guys. So t we have previously talked about um, diffusion and how cells can keep their internal conditions the same. This lesson I'm about to give you today is a little bit out of sequence from how I normally teach it, but that's okay. We're going to learn today about some of how chemical reactions are connected to biology and also how we're able to make those happen more efficiently. Because if you think about it, if I want to release energy from, say, wood or paper, right? I set it on fire, but the problem is fire's pretty hot, right? So here's the problem we have is we need to break down that energy the way fire might happen, but we can't have that heat. So we're going to learn how we can lower the heat or the energy necessary to make these things happen and um, something called enzymes and how those work. Okay, so bonds break and form during chemical reactions. So a chemical reaction is just where I change one substance into a different one. So reactants are changed and products are made. So the things that do the reacting that go into it are reactants and what I make is a product. So that is a big thing that students seem to struggle with is being able to tell like reactants from products and then substrates from enzymes. So reactants are what goes in. So that's the left side of my chemical equation. And on the right side, I have my product, the thing that I made. So when I add energy, I can add energy to break bonds and energy gets released when those bonds form. So a reaction is at equilibrium. There's that equilibrium word again, when reactants and products form at the same rate. So if something's in equilibrium, that doesn't necessarily mean nothing's happening, but it means it's completely balanced on both sides. So this is an example of a chemical reaction. So we have carbon dioxide and water, and then we have H2CO3, I'm pretty sure that's carbonic acid. That's basically like the acid that's formed in a carbonated drink. Um, but that reaction can happen both ways. It can both break apart in the water, but also it can be formed when the carbon dioxide's in the water. So chemical reactions can either release energy when I break something apart or absorb it when I put it together. So there's something called activation energy. This is one of those things we gotta understand what it means. Activation energy is how much energy needs to be absorbed to start a chemical reaction. So when I'm trying to, to grill outside, right? I put my charcoal out, I put some lighter fluid on it, but if I just let it sit there, it's not going to spontaneously combust, right? I have to add energy to make it catch fire, if that makes sense. That's my activation energy, to start that combustion reaction I have to add energy in the form of fire to make that reaction start happening, okay? So once I add energy in, the reactants all appear on this bell curve, they start reacting really quickly once they get that crucial amount of energy. Or in this other picture, when you push a, a, bowl, a ball up a hill or like a cart up a hill, you have to put in a whole bunch of energy to get it to the top, but once you do, you let go and it does its thing same kind of deal. The problem is, like we said before, I can't afford to set a fire in my stomach every time I want to release energy from my food. So we have to figure out another way to do it. All right, so exothermic reactions release more energy than they absorb. This would definitely be like combustion, okay? I light a fire, it releases a whole lot more heat energy than I put in. So the reactants have higher bond energy than products. So there's a lot of stored energy there, potential energy um, that I can, I can tap. And excess energy is then released by the reaction. This can be a good thing because you need to take the energy stored in your food and release it so that your body can do stuff with it. So we see in this bell curve right here that where it says reactants on the left-hand side, it's higher than where it says products because they have more stored energy when they began than when they ended, which 
you know, make sense. So here's some examples of exothermic reactions. So like we said, combustion is always exothermic. If when the reaction is happening, it feels hot to the touch, it is exothermic. So vinegar and baking soda actually releases heat. It's a little bit warm when you touch it. And then chemical hand warmer. So like hot hands when you're out hunting or whatever, you're able to like break the little thing inside of it and it mixes the two chemicals and it releases heat because it's an exothermic reaction. So the opposite of that is endothermic. So the products have more stored energy than the reactants do. So it's absorbing energy and storing it in that molecule. So the energy absorbed makes up the difference here. Okay, so my examples of endothermic, photosynthesis, if you've heard that word before. When I build up a sugar, a, a pro tip for this is if I start with smaller atoms or molecules and I build up to something bigger, chances are it's endothermic because it takes energy to build that molecule. So it's going to absorb it. These reactions feel cold. So like an instant cold pack, what you're doing is triggering a big endothermic reaction. You mix those two chemicals together and they start absorbing energy with whatever's going on and so it makes you feel cold. I don't know if you guys knew this, but cold isn't something that moves back and forth. What you are feeling is the absence of heat or heat being absorbed. That's going to feel cold to you. Okay, so let's talk about how we can lower that activation energy. I've been hinting at it. So there's something called catalysts. They are going to lower that energy for me. And in a living thing, those catalysts are called enzymes. So let's get into that. So catalysts speed up chemical reactions by decreasing activation energy and increasing reaction rate. On your test, it's for sure gonna ask you about the decrease in activation energy. So make a note of that if you're taking notes. Catalysts reduce or decrease activation energy. And since an enzyme is a catalyst, that's what it's going on. So in our diagram that we see on this slide, um, the top line is what would happen if I did not have a catalyst. So on its own, it takes a lot more energy. I have to put a lot more into it to make the reaction happen. Whereas if I have a catalyst, it reduces how much energy it takes. So going back to our setting a fire example, the, the accelerant or lighter fluid that I use is a lot like a catalyst it would take me a whole lot more holding that lighter to those charcoals to start that fire if I didn't give it something to help it along. So if I put gasoline on wood or if I put lighter fluid on wood and then I light it, it takes a whole lot less energy from on my part, like a lot less energy I have to input to make that combustion reaction happen. So it's something like that. Okay. So something about enzymes, they're catalysts in living things. So they do the job of a catalyst. They are needed for almost all processes. So just about everything your body does, it uses an enzyme for it. Because like we said, we remember we have to have that really narrow range of conditions. So I can't be going setting fires in my body. I have to have an enzyme that helps me reduce that energy. So instead of, you know, our wonderful 98.6 that our body usually rocks, we're at, you know, 350 because somebody had to burn those cookies they ate earlier. Like, we, do, we can't do that. <laughs> anyway. Okay, so enzymes, like us, have work in a very small range of conditions. So disruptions in homeostasis can prevent your enzymes from functioning. That is why you don't want your body to get too hot. That's why a lot of the things our body does happen is we have to prevent our enzymes from getting denatured and homeostasis from being disrupted. So there are some things that are going to affect homeostasis, uh, sorry, affect our enzymes. Change in temperature, so heat, sometimes too cold, but usually if it's too hot, and then pH, both of those break hydrogen bonds. Remember, protein folding happens because of hydrogen bonding. So if I cook it, 
like when you cook an egg, um, you are disrupting the hydrogen bondings and changing the shape of the protein, and thus you are changing the shape of, um, of the enzyme and changing what it does. So proteins and egg whites change when you cook them. So that's what we're seeing right here. So a raw egg on the right, it's kind of clear, right, and kind of liquidy. But when I fry it in a skillet, those proteins get changed and they coagulate and they make cooked egg. So this is what happens to an enzyme. Same thing, the heat supplied and it changes what it does. Okay, so this lock and key model right here, this is gonna be on your test and you're gonna have to label it. So I'd suggest getting real familiar real quick with this. So the things that go on the enzyme, the reactants are called substrates. So these things, this, the two pieces up top, those are substrates. Maybe I want to put together two different molecules of sugar to try to make a, a starch, right? So we're going to, they each will lock onto a specific place on that enzyme. Those places are called active sites. So those places where the substrate attaches is an active site. Okay. So here we go, we got it step by step. So the substrates bind to an enzyme at a place called an active site. The enzyme brings them together and weakens their bonds and then pushes them together so that they form a new product. So this product, this new thing it put together is released and the enzyme gets to be reused. So I can use the same enzyme over and over again um, to make different products or to break things down. A good example of this is um, something called amylase. If you see A-S-E at the end of a word, a lot of times it means it's an enzyme. So amylase breaks down starch and it's something that's in your spit. So if you wanna try this at home, you take a little piece of like a, a saltine cracker and you put it on your tongue, make sure there's lots of spit on your tongue and you let it sit there. In a couple of minutes, it's gonna go from tasting kind of, you know, I guess a little bit salty, and it's gonna start tasting sweet as the enzyme breaks that sugar down. And you don't have to like keep making new enzyme for that to happen. The existing enzyme is gonna break apart that starch into sugar and go find another starch molecule to do the same thing to, if that makes sense, hopefully it does. Okay, I think that's the last slide. So lock, this is the lock and key model. They can only go on certain things, or the only certain molecules can attach to that enzyme. Okay, so those active sites are super specific. It's going to force those two substrates or reactants to interlock to do something, and then it releases them to do something else. Okay, so please let me know if you have any questions on this, and I will see you guys in the next video. Take care.